grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you hate nothing you have made, and you forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and honest hearts, so that truly repenting of our sins we may receive from you, the God of all mercy, full pardon and forgiveness, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson is from the book of Joel, chapter 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of cloud and of thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God? Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breasts. Let the bridegroom leave the room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples, where is their God? Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Corinthians chapters 5 and 6. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he said, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacles in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors, yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having not, nothing and yet possessing everything. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, Beware of practicing your piety in front of others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. 
But when you do give alms, do not let, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the street corners and on the streets, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they've received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consume and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Before you say anything, I know. All right, I know. Ash Wednesday is not the same online. Of all the services that we've had to adjust to doing digitally, this is one of the hardest for me because I appreciate its meaning and its form so much. There's just no way to digitally approximate having ashes imposed on you as a reminder of your mortality, as a symbol of your repentance. There's no way to digitally approximate the intimacy of being touched by another human being, of touching another human being. As a pastor, I especially lament the powerful act of being trusted to be the one imposing those ashes on each of you, of being the person that you have chosen to remind you on this day that you are dust and that to dust you shall return. It's a profound and solemn duty, one that I deeply appreciate and respect and one that this year I miss a lot. We've all had to give up so much this year so much that I've heard people ask the question if we even really need Lent this year because we've already been fasting for 48 weeks. Or if we need Ash Wednesday because this pandemic is just one giant reminder of our mortality. This service is going to be one of the last things that we will have to give up for the first time. Soon we'll be missing out on celebrating Holy Week and Easter again this for the second time just like we did last year. I think it's worth admitting that this observance of Ash Wednesday tonight, like so many other things, it's not how we want it to be. It's not how it should be. To be able to say that, to say that things are not as they should be, to be able to say it with other people, is to have that solidarity with one another in our frustration our disappointment and our sorrow, and that's powerful. Such communal lament is what reminds us that we're not alone in our grief. When we can't make pain go away, feeling the presence of others with us in that pain, knowing that we're not bearing it alone, is at least some comfort. And that, my friends, is why we observe Ash Wednesday every year. We smear ashes on our foreheads and we spend a little bit of extra time in confession of sin and we're reminded that our, of our dustiness because all those things are ways that we have to say together and publicly that things are not as they should be. Most years we're just talking about the normal ills of the world, things like war and disease, poverty and oppression, climate change and mass extinction. But this year, our list includes pandemic and the disruption and the isolation and the grief that that brings with it. 
In the Bible, folks who wanted to publicly acknowledge that things are not as they should be dress in sackcloth and smear or sprinkle ashes on their heads. It's a visible sign that something is amiss. Often it's a sign of mourning and acknowledgement that someone has died and that that death has altered the world in a fundamental way for the person who is wearing that sign. It can also be a sign of repentance, an admission that I as a person or that we as a community have not been doing the things that we should be, that we've not been being the people we ought to be, that we've recognized that and we're trying to do better. That's the origin of this strange ritual ritual that we observe every year in February. I think that wearing this physical sign, even if it's only in the church building for an hour or so, it's an important thing for us to do because we have no other way of making that statement. I thought long and hard about what else I could do as a part of this service to take place, take the place of the imposition of ashes this year. And frankly, I came up blank. But there's a good reason for that. Unlike the ancient Hebrews, or even many contemporary cultures, we don't have any cultural signs of mourning or repentance. We have all sorts of signs and rituals and traditions for marking celebrations. There's toasts and gift exchanges and dances and parties and receptions. But there's nothing that we do to mark grief or regret or sadness. We have funerals, but even those are beginning to die out, no pun intended, in favor of celebrations of life, because we'd rather celebrate than grieve. We don't think that there's any room for public displays of grief in our society. When my dad died a couple of years ago, I found I couldn't just pretend that everything was fine and go back to life as it had been. I didn't have the desire or the energy to go around crying or frowning all the time, but I needed something to acknowledge that for me, the world was different now, that I was different, that I'd been changed by his death. And I didn't have any sackcloth to wear, and I felt it might be a little bit unhygienic to smear ashes on myself for a long period of time but I needed some physical sign that I was not the same person I had been before he died. So I ended up kind of accidentally wearing a beard. It's a, it, some of you may remember it. It was a really scraggly, patchy, nasty beard. I intentionally didn't shave it or trim it, except to keep it out of my mouth. I didn't do that because it wasn't a fashion statement. I didn't feel the need to explain it to everybody to say, this is why I'm wearing a beard, but I didn't have to because whether or not people understood it, they knew looking at me that I looked different. And that's all I needed. I just needed something to say that something's changed. Now, nobody likes to dwell on feeling bad, but consider the result of this lack of rituals to acknowledge mourning and repentance in our society. We have no way to publicly express our desire for things to be different, to collectively telegraph our disappointment and our frustration, and to invite people into that sadness and regret with us. And so these things just remain bottled up and unexpressed until they explode in public expressions of anger and outrage, like polarization and bigotry and protests and violence. That doesn't seem healthy to me. Ash Wednesday is one of the few times and the few ways that we have to acknowledge before God and everyone in the world that this world is not the way it should be. It's one of the few times and the few ways we have to express that this makes us feel sadness and regret and even shame. It's our opportunity to take off the smiles that we have plastered on our faces all the time for a moment and to remind ourselves and everyone around us that sometimes the world is kind of a mess, that sometimes that's partly our fault. 
Even this pandemic, a relatively random and unavoidable fluke of nature, has been made much, much worse by governmental mismanagement and poor messaging, and the selfishness and denial and fear of ordinary people like you and me. Maybe you've even been a part of that. But lamenting like this in a community is not just about giving space to our feelings of disquiet. When we express our disappointment that things are not as they ought to be, we are also expressing hope. Hope that there is a way that things should be. That there is some entity or some force or some will out there in the universe that has the right and the authority to determine the way things ought to be. And so, as counterintuitive as it might seem, lament is fundamentally an expression of hope. A hope that there is a greater truth that exists beyond all of us, that is bigger than all of us, that life is not all just a bunch of relativistic perspectives. Ash Wednesday and the imposition of ashes invites us for a moment into that hope, into that hope for a vision of a world that is better and kinder and more just and loving than the one that we have. These things give us that hope that this vision isn't just in our heads, that it's real, that it exists even if we don't live up to that vision. We acknowledge on this day that we are not gods, that we are only creatures formed out of dust waiting to return to dust. And when we do that, we are acknowledging that although we are not gods, there is one who is greater than us, who holds and casts that vision for us, and who promises a place in it. The invitation made to us in the season of Lent is to recommit ourselves to that vision, to turn from all the things in this life that we use to distract and anesthetize ourselves from the pains and the difficulties of this world so that we can stare those things in the face and that we might hope for a world in which those things no longer have any power over us. We're invited to strengthen our spiritual practices or take up new ones to remind ourselves to look toward that vision of a better world and also, frankly, to see the ways that we fail to live up to that vision. The cross of ashes that we smear on our foreheads this, each year, it's not alone. That cross always sits on top of another cross, one that was marked there at our baptism. The ashes just make up, excuse me, the, the ash cross just makes that first cross visible just as our failures make visible the vision to which we cannot live up. And that making visible is a grace, not just for us, but for everybody. It reminds us who we are and whose we are, that even when that first cross is tarnished and soiled by our shortcomings, it's still there. The cross of ash is a sign that the ways that we fail God's vision do not negate that vision itself, that it still exists, that it's still real, whether or not we are helping it. Just like that ash cross, our spiritual practices make that vision visible to us and to the people around us. They remind us that the divine love has a claim on us, that, yeah, we may be dust, but we are dust that has been ordered and formed and brought to life by the divine love that is still working to bring order and form to this world, to bring life to this world as well. They remind us that while we are between dusts, we have been given the capacity and the responsibility to share that life with which our Maker has imbued us. So yes, tonight is not the same as it has been. It's not the way it should be. We're not able to celebrate it like we would like to or like we should, 
But to be honest, I think that this discordant observance of Ash Wednesday kind of makes the point just as clearly as the ash crosses we normally put on our heads. Just the same as those practices of prayer and fasting and charitable giving that mark our lives as Christians, hopefully our entire lives, but especially during Lent. Even if this isn't the way it ought to be, today we still enter into the season of Lent, and we still remember that the world is not the way it ought to be. At least, not yet. Siblings in Christ, beloved of God. Today with the whole church, we enter into a time of preparation and renewal as we journey through the wilderness with Israel to our promised home in the victorious feast of Easter. We were created to experience joy and communion with God, to love one another and to live in harmony with creation, but that is not the life we live. Things are not as they should be. Lent is a time for us to lament together the brokenness of this world and to acknowledge our own complacency with and even our own contributions toward that brokenness. It is also a time for us to remember that this brokenness and our part in it cannot and does not separate us permanently from the one who calls us through this wilderness of suffering and tragedy and death. It is in the hope of God's vision of wholeness and peace and justice for all creation that we once again commit ourselves to that vision and to this journey. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to turn away from our slavery to the treasures and the false promises of Egypt and to follow into the wilderness. I invite you to walk with me this path of Lent. I invite you into this time of intentional self-examination and repentance, into the practices of prayer and fasting and sacrificial giving and works of love, practices which will not only prepare us and those around us to arrive at our destination, but will remind us along the way of where it is that we're headed. We are not called to walk this path alone. 
we will be strengthened and nourished along the way by the one who calls us with the gifts of word and sacrament, our manna along this desert journey. Let us continue on together through these 40 days to the great three days of Jesus' death and resurrection. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and before the whole company of heaven that we have sinned by our fault, by our own fault, by our own most grievous fault, in thought, in word, and in deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, O God. We have shut our ears to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, O God. Our past unfaithfulness, the pride, envy, hypocrisy, and apathy that have infected our lives, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways, and our explo exploitation of other people, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our negligence in prayer and worship, and our failure to share the faith that is in us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our neglect of human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our false judgments, our uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Our waste and our pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us, we confess to you. Have mercy on us, O God. Restore us, O God. Let your anger depart from us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In the beginning, God created us out of the dust of the earth. Ashes are intended to be a sign to us of our mortality and penitence, reminding us that it is only by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are given eternal life. Since we cannot impose ashes this year, I invite you to do one of two things. First, find a dusty place in your house, a place where you haven't swept or cleaned for a while. Or find a potted plant or take the soot from an extinguished candle flame. Wipe your thumb in that dirt in lieu of ashes. Or if you prefer, get some water. Dip your thumb in that as a reminder of our death with Christ in baptism. And then use either that dirt or that water to trace the sign of the cross on your own forehead or on the forehead of a family member or friend that you're with. Trace the sign of that cross and make it visible, if only for a moment, and to point the eyes of your heart towards God's vision for all creation. As you trace this cross, say to yourself or to the person with you, remember that you are dust, to dust you shall return. Remember that you have died with Christ and are now alive in him.
May the God who creates us all keep our eyes forever on the cross, the sign of the world to come, the shape of the life that we have been given to share. Amen. Let us pray. Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Savior, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. O oh God, you call your church to be ministers of reconciliation throughout the world. Inspire your church in its proclamation of the gospel and guide its ministries to build up the body of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you created the earth and all its inhabitants, and you declared that it is good Protect mountains and valleys, animals and plants, and direct us to be good stewards of all you have made. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you desire peace. Direct governments and leaders to work for the well-being of all people and raise up advocates to speak and serve on behalf of the downtrodden. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you are our hope in the midst of despair, our help in the midst of sorrow, and our consolation in the midst of affliction. Grant comfort to all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, and support caregivers who attend to all in need. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. O oh God, you are love, and you call us to love one another. Accompany with your grace those journeying towards baptism, and call us all to repentance as we prepare to celebrate Christ's death and resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you are our life and our salvation. We give you thanks for the righteous who have died in faith. Inspire us by their example to proclaim your steadfast love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us prepare now our homes and our hearts to share in the holy meal with which God nourishes us along our journey. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, of the journey. Your mercy is everlasting, and your faithfulness endures from age to age. You set your bow in the clouds as a sign to Noah, gave Abram and Sarai new names to seal your covenant in the wilderness. You blessed Israel with your law, an everlasting testament to your love for them. Through grumbling and rebellion, through wilderness and exile, you remained with your people, faithful when we were faithless, until the time when you sent your Son to establish a new covenant which could not be broken, to write your law upon our hearts. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this for the remembrance of me again after supper he took the cup when he had given thanks he gave it for all to drink saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin 
for the remembrance of me. Whenever we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. You are with us still, faithful God. Send your Holy Spirit and strengthen us for our journey with this bread and cup, a foretaste of the feast that is to come when all the world be fed at your table of justice and mercy. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Join our prayers with Noah, with Abraham and Sarah, with Moses and Joshua, with the prophets and martyrs of every age who have looked with the eyes of faith to see your promised deliverance, which you have made tangible in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, all honor and glory is yours, O divine beloved, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. If you are not receiving the meal this evening, receive this blessing. May Christ be ever before you on your journey to guide you on your way, ever behind you to watch over you, and ever at your side to give you company. Amen. If you are receiving the meal tonight, hear these words of promise. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in life that is eternal. Amen. Let us pray. God of steadfast love, at this table that is one and yet many, you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world. Send us in the power of your spirit that our lives may bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. 
the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, share the good news. Thanks be to God. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with someone you know with a phone call or a text or an email by sending them the link to the service or posting on your social media page so that we can worship together. God bless you in your week. And God bless you on your Lenten journey.